You're watching Shalom TV, celebrating all things Jewish. challenge is uh, really if it will remain in ret rhetoric I would advise my government not to deal with it but because they are trying to acquire a weapon a nuclear military capability it's becoming a serious problem to Israel especially within already somebody before me mentioned that they were willing to threaten openly and directly and calling for the destruction of the state of Israel. I have to, when I'm asking myself the question, if there is an existing scenario, if they'll have in their possession a nuclear capability, are going to use such a weapon against Israel? The answer is that in some remote cases, such a possibility exists. And if this is the answer, I don't think that Israel can tolerate to see Iran armed with a nuclear capability. The real question about Iran is uh, how you are tackling with the problem and what are the ways that you are dealing with it. I think in this issue, Israel made a few mistakes. We were very useful in translating the Iranian problem, describe it as an Israeli problem even though the Iranian problem is not an Israeli problem. It's first of all an international problem, and especially to the countries in the region. Because um, one of the main goals is to become a superpower in the Middle East. And the other one is uh, to have a leverage over, the, uh, uh, over all the neighboring countries. And when we are looking very carefully about who are the neighboring countries, they are going to have under their leverage, if they will be armed with a nuclear capability, they uh, will have a leverage of 65% uh, 65, 65 of the well-known oil reserves of the world. Because the production of um, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, Iraq, Iran, the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, this is a very important source of energy for the, the whole world. I heard a very interesting remark that said, uh, why should we Americans care about it? Because we are buying only 7% of oil in the Gulf. Um, you have to understand that if you are not buying it, but Europe is buying much more, and China is buying much more. And if well, the implication of rising the prices of oil will hit those countries, I believe it will have a devastating because of your close economical ties with China and with Europe. It will have a devastating impact on your economy. And it will lead those countries politically under some kind of leverage by the Iranians. Uh, I think the Iranian challenge is going to, we are going to face it in the near future. Till this point in time, they don't have in their possession a nuclear capability. Unfortunately, they learned very closely the events that were taking place in North Korea. And they saw that um, the international community is unwilling to deal with a country that is armed with a nuclear capability. As such, they are seeing those weapons as a vital is strategically important for them, first of all, by creating an insurance for the regime to continue to be running Iran, if they will have such a weapon. They, assume, they are assuming that in those conditions, nobody is going to interfere internally in Iran. And second, it will create them a strategic advantage and a leverage of all the neighboring countries. And because Iran is uh, the most important source of income for the Iranian is oil, 
then they have a built-in interest to raise the prices of oil. The last challenge that Israel is facing is the internal situation in Israel. And this is our political system. Our political system reached to a point where the government is unable to control the state and unable to, to, to really dominate the country. 70% more of the governmental decisions are not executed. Um, if I will see the criteria of what is an effective uh, government, you have to ask yourself uh, a few questions. The first one, is the state capable of reaching to a decision of life and death, war and peace? Is the regime stable? Is he able to, to make long-term planning? Is he able to take sensitive decision about uh, delicate political issue? Are they able to allocate and use the resources and the spending of the money by parties? And are you creating a source of equality in the country? If I'm measuring all those criteria, I have to admit that the government, and I'm not referring to this government, because I don't see any big difference on those aspects between the government of Benjamin Netanyahu and previous governments. I believe the only exception we had in the past was when Arik Sharon, in the first government, government that he established, he was not bringing in the Shaft Party, and as such, he in the first time created a, a different system that was not operating for a very long time. We are caught into a, a situation where we are forced to create a coalition government. In a coalition government, the shift, there is a shift of power between the major parties to those who are becoming balancing parties. And those balancing parties are becoming the real power that is dominating the policies of Israel. And uh, to summarize it, I will summarize it by saying the next phrase. Anyone who is working, paying taxes, serving the military, the country is not doing anything for him. Anyone who is not working, not paying taxes, not serving the military, is receiving support from the state. I was trying to look upon how the different ministries uh, allocating money and what is their spending. And we were looking upon the last seven governments. Don't be mistaken, a government, the time of a government in Israel is less than two years. The ministers housing in the last 15 years had 10 ministers. And uh, when we were measuring how they are spending the money, only four ministries were able to spend more than 80% of the budget. All the rest of the ministries were really not reaching even to the level of 70% of spending. The meaning of it, they are really not executing what uh, is asked from them, because they are not forming the plans that they have to execute in the country. We created a unique system where today we have 120 members in the parliament. 28 of them are ministers and 11 of them are deputy ministers. Then we have today a government that is sitting around the table, almost 40 members. All of them are parliament members. If you are looking about the prime minister, there are more ministers from different parties than from his own party. He is isolated in his own party. Uh, I can go on and on on this situation. And unfortunately, our situation is becoming on the edge that our political system is collapsing. And the last event uh, was presented to the public by the uprise of the young people in, during the summer, 
that were demonstrating so-called um, social activities, but really it was referring that there, no, there is no real involvement by the state to solve basic problem in the Israeli society. We Jews know how to unite ourselves against an external threat. We always, always knew how to find a common understanding and a common cooperation how to deal with threats from the outside. Our internal situation is much worse and it deteriorating, if I'm measuring, since a point in time, 1977, when Begin took uh, the power and the power was shifted from the Labour Party to the Likud Party. And it's becoming on the edge that nobody is really able to rally and to deal with serious issues. If we want an example of a delicate situation, I will, that the country is unable to deal, I will describe you at least two of them. One of them, there is a question of who is a Jew. The Israeli government is unable, through their political system, to take a legal decision and to declare clearly and openly, even though the majority already decided. What's, what's really not decided by small groups of religious parties. The other example I will give you is we accepted very close to a million people from Russia. Many of them were come from uh, marriages between uh, Gentiles and Jews. And the military was uh, very smartly organizing a way how to convert those people who had questions about uh, the fact that they are Jews and uh, convert them to, to become Jews. And it was done according to what we are calling the detailed tradition of Israel. I would call it even Giyur Ka'alacha. But it was not accepted by religious parties. Then today we have a unique situation where our rabbinical system is not recognizing the fact that those people are Jews. And the military was converting those, believe me, he did a good, very good job in it, converting those Jews and uh, those unfortunate people are caught in a political conflict between different groups. And believe me, I, can, I am able to add more and more examples, and none of them are very pleasant. And from my point of view, the internal problem is the most serious one of all of those that I described. And I will stop at this point, and if you have any question, I'll try to answer you to the best of my knowledge. Some of us are very worried that with all the problems that you have really described in great clarity of the neighborhood, they are not going to stay still for the next two, three years. And with the increasing of the danger, when do you think and how do you think is the best solution for Israel to face this existential threat? The direct threat against Israel for its existence is really coming from one direction, from the Iranian if they will be armed with a nuclear capability. I don't think that uh, nor Iraq, nor Egypt, and nor even Jordan and Syria are now have any intention of uh, launching a military strike against Israel and eliminate the state of Israel. At least uh, I had previously very close relationship with some of those leaders and I heard what our real intention. I don't think that any one of those countries presented internally a major goal to launch an attack against Israel. The only real issue that have a potential of an existing existential threat against Israel lies with the nuclear capability of Iran. Now let's say, ask a little bit ourselves the question is um, how to deal with the problem. Is it uh, wise that Israel will attack the nuclear project? 
when you are considering any military action, you have to take in consideration answers for three questions. The first one is uh, what you are going to achieve by a military strike. The second is um, what will be the consequences of such an attack. And the third, if you already started a regional war, how you are going to finish it. And uh, when I study a little bit those uh, elements, I came to a conclusion that, uh, first of all, it's wrong to make an assumption and to create this uh, issue between Iran and Israel as an Israeli problem. It's much more related to other interests. Second, I'm looking very close to the nuclear sites. It is containing of three elements. One is the knowledge, and we are not speaking about a new technology. Technology of nuclear capabilities is, uh, unfortunately, more than 60, more than 80 years, if you are referring to the tests that Fermi did in the University of Chicago. And if uh, we are launching when the first time such a weapon was introduced, I believe in August uh, 1945 was the first time that such a weapon been thrown on a target in, uh, on Japan then we are not speaking about a new technology. And I don't think that we are really capable of dealing with the knowledge because the science community in Iran is, very, is a very big uh, community. To the best of my knowledge, they have all the knowledge that is related to the project. They have uh, not only the knowledge, they have blueprint that they receive from the Pakistanis even uh, the blueprint of uh, what we are calling the Chinese bomb. And uh, this part of the knowledge cannot be dealt. It's simply in the brains of people. And you are not able to eliminate all the scientists in Iran. What can you do? You can deal with only one factor, is a deal with the industrial infrastructure that is producing elements apart for the project. This you can do efficiently and very effectively. And then you have to ask yourself the question, let's say that we are quite successful, and I believe the Israeli effort is almost capable of doing the impossible. And I don't think that the, it will be a, such a difficult problem for them to hit targets in Iran. The real question is uh, for how are you able to stop the project, or even if we are destroying all of them, how much time it will take the Iran to rebuild it? My conclusion is uh, that in best case scenario, we are able to delay the project for two to three years. And then you have to ask yourself what are going to be the consequences? Let's speak about the regional consequences. We are going to be involved in the midst of a regional war because the Iranians have hundreds of missiles that are able to shell Israel on almost every target. Uh, the Hezbollah, with no any any hesitation, is going to participate in the pan in the party, and already somebody mentioned that they have very close to fifty thousand rockets. Not all of them Katyusha rockets. If they had only Katyusha rockets, believe me, I would not consider it as a, as a serious issue. Unfortunately, a great deal of their capabilities is long-range capabilities, not short-range capabilities. And uh, they are going to be part of it. And not only this, if I'm looking on Bashar Assad, who have a very close relationship, and in a way, a security alliance with the Iranians, and he is suffering from internal problem, probably, we might see the Syrian participating as an alternative to deal with their own internal problems. But let's say that we are dealing with such a war and we will be capable of doing so. What kind of impact it will have on Iran? First, it will be considered by the Iranian 
as an act of war, and they're going to retaliate. Second, I mentioned a few things about the Iranian society. I would say that in this point, if we are going to attack Iranian targets, we are going to rally and galvanize the Iranian society behind the leadership. Not only this, we are going to provide them with the best excuse why to produce a nuclear weapon. Simply, they are going to say, gentlemen, till now we were developing a project for peace purposes and to solve and to arrange for our country cheaper energy. Now we were attacked by what is known in foreign press, that Israel has nuclear capabilities. And we have to defend ourselves. The only way that we can uh, defend ourselves is to have a deterrence against Israel. The real way how to have a deterrence against Israel is to produce a nuclear capability. Then what we are going to achieve? We are going to be facing a determined regime that is going to continue to fight against us. We are going to galvanize and solve all the internal problems of Iran and rally the support of the people behind the leadership. We are going to provide the justification for a weapon, for um, what I call a military weapon, which is going to be developed by the Iranians. And now let's look about the last issue. How you are stopping this, those events? How you are stopping the war? It's usually not ended by itself. We are not going to, and it's going to be a very unique war. It's not going to be a war between armies. We are not going to see confrontation of tanks and military units. We are going to see simply a very hard case of firepower that is going to be launched on Israeli targets. Are we ready for it? Are the, our home front prepared for such an attack? I suggest you will see what is happening in Israel as a result of a small event called Gaza. In the last two weeks, two weeks, we are exchanging fire with not Iran, not with a state, but with a terrorist organization in the size of a few thousands. And they are able to put all of us in Beersheba and in Jderot and in Ofakim and in uh, Ashdod and even in Ashkelon, all of them in shelters. And we are incapable to finish the business so quickly. And this is not something beyond, beyond the horizon. This is something that's allocated five minutes from the Israeli borders. And I believe that it will have a devastating impact on Israel. And to finish such a war, Israel will have to turn to the United States and to Europe. And I know those countries. They are going to ask themselves, gentlemen, what we are able to extract from the Israeli for solving for their own problem, a war. At least I will give you two issues that uh, could be what I call a price that Israel might pay. The first one was they'll force upon us a solution on the Palestinian issue. And I'm not reflecting any political approach. Any solution that is going to be imposed on Israel is a bad solution for Israel. Second one, uh, Egypt is always claiming that they would like to see that uh, the Middle East will be clear from its strategic capabilities. And probably those countries will come to Israel and will uh, ask uh, us to eliminate our strategic capabilities. I think it uh, will have a devastating impact on Israel. And when I'm measuring those factors, I don't think that uh, the right approach to deal with such an existential problem is by attacking it. I think that we have to adopt, adopt a different policy. Uh, I can make a long speech now, what is the different policy, but uh, I spare me the time. There is an existing way how to deal with the top problem with different tools. You started your presentation talking about external threats to Israel, and you ended your presentation speaking about internal threats to Israel. 
about instability, about the impossibility of the government uh, to implement long-term strategy and long-term thinking. Can you give us just in short what your plan uh, to, to improve the, the situation on these internal uh, risks? Thank you very much for the question. I think there is a need of the change of the law and it's based on a few elements. And I will discuss also the tactic how to do it. First of all, we would like very much to change the ratio of uh, percentage that parties are p uh, coming into the parliament. Today is 2%. We want to raise it to 3% and above, and maybe to reach the point of 5%. And this, by definition, will eliminate small parties. Not eliminate, it will not allow them to become as members in the parliament. Second, we don't want to see ministers are becoming parliament members. We think that any minister should not be a parliament member. Because we are seeing today what's happening we, we almost have 38 members of the parliament serving the government. Third, we want to see that some of our parliament members, half of them will be elected in the regions, and half of them will be elected on regular terms. And we think by itself it's also raised the percentage of somebody to come in into the parliament. We think that um, we have to create that the prime minister is going to be the one of the heading, heading the biggest party. And it's not be dependent on a coalition. Another issue, we think that the prime minister should be protected and cannot be voted out by a regular majority. You have to be voted out by a special majority. We think it have to be 61%, which means 74 members of the parliament can vote out the, the prime minister. I think that those are the basic principle of what we want to do. This is in general terms the idea, and I sincerely really think that uh, this is a, the most serious threat that Israel is facing. Because in all other cases, we, have, we had ups and downs. In our system, you can see a gradual declining of the ability of the government to govern the state. And I believe that we are reaching to um, an unbearable situation that we are creating law that could not be accepted by the Israeli society, like the law of Tal, that is allowing a group of people in Israel not to participate and not in work, not in work power, and not serving the military. And those people are sitting in the government. And try to imagine that we are going to deal with the Iranian issue. And something do you have to raise his voice if he is going to vote for it or against it. And from the moral point of view, a representative that his people, his party, are not participating in the military, are going to raise their hands for an attack in Iran. I think it's an unbearable situation. And I think that the system must be changed. Thank all the, you, all of you. All those in favor, say aye. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much, General Dagan. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.